Hello, it's a pleasure to have the, uh, the privilege to address the, uh, the Global Goals uh, Forum. Um, my, my thesis, very, very simply put, is that globalization is over. Uh, this is an incredibly uh, urgent uh, development in, in world affairs, uh, in, in economics, um, and, and that the world order effectively over the next 10 to 15 years uh, is passing from this era of extraordinary peace and prosperity to uh, something new. And what I'll try and do, maybe in the next 20, 25 minutes, uh, is give you some reasons for why I think globalization is uh, coming asunder, uh, where we're going, and what the uh, potential uh, end point is. Uh, just to, to preface my remarks, uh, the end of globalization is a potentially uh, gloomy topic. And I don't mean to be gloomy. Um, I am uh, resolutely in favour of globalisation because it was a period in world affairs where billions of people um, were raised out of poverty. Uh, we've had so much uh, innovation. It was in general a period of uh, great peace. So we should lament um, its passing and we should do everything we possibly can uh, to make sure that the next 10, 15 uh, years and beyond uh, resemble this period of globalization uh, in terms of the, uh, the the positive factors. But at the same time, uh, I think we have to confront the fact that this period uh, is now over. And what troubles me somewhat is, you know, we've just had uh, four or five months ago, we've had events like the, the World Economic Forum, where people are only just beginning uh, to get to get to grips with the, the fact that globalization is ending. And I find many people, policymakers, corporate leaders, etc., cetera, uh, are in denial. And, and I really want to, to push the urgency of this. Uh, if you look today, all of the, the positive factors uh, associated with globalization, very low inflation, low interest rates, uh, peace, all of those have been violently uh, reversed in uh, the course of 2022. We've had uh, record high inflation for the last four decades uh, from countries from Germany to Sri Lanka across the US. Uh, interest rates are rising uh, and of course we have the uh, savage and tragic uh, invasion of Ukraine by, uh, by Russia. So uh, this thesis is being tested in a very, very, uh, in a very, very hard way. Uh, just for a bit of background, um, my own um, fascination or now obsession with globalization uh, goes back a long time. Uh, I grew up in Ireland um, and around uh, 1990, Ireland, which had a, a very pedestrian economic history, started to change quite dramatically. Um, the uh, GDP began to pick up. We saw uh, massive foreign investment and that began a period of quite dramatic change in Irish society and in the Irish economy, which uh, I think has become uh, well known around the world. Uh, and that spurred my fascination for the effect of globalization on small open economies uh, in particular. Wrote a couple of books about this um, and have kept a track on globalization uh, ever since. Um, and, and where we are today, I think, is we're coming to the end of that period of uh, prosperity. Uh, and to me, globalization really has meant a world that is uh, interconnected, that's interdependent, um, uh, and if you like, that is, um, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, in some kind of harmony with this kind of uh, state of affairs. Uh, and that interconnectedness, that interdependence, um, is now beginning to uh, to unravel in a, in a chaotic way. Uh, perhaps the best illustration of that has been the effect on uh, supply chains uh, during 2021-2022. Uh, um, globalization had managed to persist for some 20 or 30 years. We've had uh, periods of extraordinarily long um, expansion in terms of the uh, business cycles that has been tested along the way. The global financial crisis, in my view, was uh, a test of the excesses of financial globalization and a lot of the 
uh, the, a, a lot of the, the side effects of that have scarred economies in Europe uh, and beyond over the course of the last 10 years. Uh, and what we've begun to see maybe in the last five years is that we've had more tests of globalization and the, the, the greater the number of tests we've had, um, globalization or the world order has begun to uh, has begun to to come asunder. Uh, one of those tests was Brexit. The other was the election of Donald Trump uh, in the States. Um, and in both of those countries, there's, been, there's a very interesting parallel. Uh, the first wave of globalization in the 19th century uh, was led by Britain. Uh, the recent leg of globalization was led by the, the US. So globalization effectively has been an Anglo-Saxon phenomenon. And what is interesting is that the two big Anglo-Saxon countries have actually done little uh, to spread the benefits of globalization. If we go back to my example of Ireland uh, and other small advanced economies, Switzerland, Sweden, Singapore, New Zealand, they're all very exposed to globalization, but in general, uh, they don't have uh, problems, for example, such as inequality or wealth inequality, because they, they're, they're very alert to globalization, to the imbalances it causes uh, and they use their tax uh, and social welfare systems to spread uh, its benefits across society. And that's been much, much less the case in the UK uh, and in the US. In the US, wealth inequality is uh, egregious. It's the most uh, extreme uh, on record. If you go back and look at wealth data, uh, even back to the 1920s, I've gone back as far as the Roman Empire. Um, and I couldn't find data in terms of income inequality that would match what we're seeing uh, in the U.S. today. So in both of those countries, who have, which have been effectively in the engine room of globalization, imbalances uh, have been produced. And I, I, I don't blame these imbalances on globalization. Rather, I blame them on the choices that individual governments have made um, in terms of how to spread the benefits of globalization. Do you allow benefits to go to corporates or do you spread them uh, more broadly across countries uh, and that has led to tension it's led to a crisis of identity in the UK which has given us uh, Brexit and all of the the chaos that that has brought uh, and in the US it's led to uh, extreme political volatility uh, and a very very much uh, divided uh, polity there's been other tests of uh, globalization one that really troubled me uh, was Hong Kong, the snuffing out of uh, democracy in Hong Kong. Globalization started effectively with the fall of communism and the spread of democracy and the rise in the number of democracies around the world. Um, and that's such a thriving and dynamic city state as Hong Kong uh, has been subsumed almost without protest from the outside world uh, is a, a troubling piece in that jigsaw. Uh, and then we've had COVID which has stress tested uh, the world economy, I think has produced great positives in terms of how the majority of people have reacted. It's produced positives in terms of uh, technological uh, and medical advances, but its great failing has been the, the utter lack of um, collaboration, communication between the, the major countries. Remember during COVID, uh, the big countries, the US and China, and to an extent Europe as well, squabbling over uh, masks, uh, over vaccines. And it was a crisis that was unusual in the sense that there was no sense of a, a, a committee to save the world. If you go back to the Asian crisis, uh, the, 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 uh, the global financial crisis, there was always a sense that the big countries would come together um, and uh, cobble together some kind of solution. And we didn't see any of that during COVID. So for me, at an institutional level, uh, that was a, a, a failure. And, and then add to that uh, the, the war in Ukraine, which I think is the sort of final nail in the coffin, which seems to have convinced many people that this era of globalization has now come to, to an end. Um, so this begs a whole range of questions. Um, where are we going? What's the, the end point? Uh, and secondly, what is the journey going to look like? Well, my, my own personal view of the end point is that in 10 or 15 years, we end up at a, a, a more coherent point 
um, that I would characterize as a multipolar world. And that multipolar world is going to be based around at least three regions, the, the US, Europe, uh, and China. And it's not simply a question of these regions being big and powerful, but that they have increasingly different values, ways of doing things, and distinct approaches to policy. Uh, remember that you know globalization was effectively driven by uh, by the by, by the U.S. It's an Anglo-Saxon phenomenon. There was effectively one way of of doing things. Um, I think where we're headed now is that there will be many different ways of doing things, and they will be values driven. If you take the internet as an example, the internet used to be a global public good, um, whereas China has now uh, fenced off its internet. And it has a massive, at the same time, massive e-commerce sector. In the US, the internet or social media is a huge financial phenomenon uh, in the sense that it dominates the stock market. Europe doesn't have that. Uh, but in Europe, there's a very different emphasis on protecting consumers uh, and their, their data. Um, and these values-based approaches uh, to economics, to foreign policy, I think, will only grow stronger. Europe is a great example. Um, there's been an acceleration in the values-based uh, approach to European policy in the last two or three years, notably uh, in terms of tensions with countries like Poland uh, and Hungary. Um, I think that values-based approach is to the great advantage of groups like women, uh, the lesbian gay community, uh, and, 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 and fully support that, but it won't be um, uh, I, I think an easy um, uh, an easy path politically with some of these countries. Uh, European foreign policy as well has been accelerated uh, by what's happened in Ukraine and the need for a more coherent values-based uh, foreign policy. Uh, and then we shouldn't forget that China is a very, very old uh, country. If you go back to uh, the early 17th century, China made up about 30% of world GDP. Um, one of the things that troubles me is that there are very, very few people in the States uh, and Europe who really try and understand China uh, and, and give them credit for having a different approach uh, to, uh, to, to ec economics, to world affairs. Uh, and in China, there's a very, very clear and distinct uh, contract between the state and the people that the state will provide prosperity and in return, people effectively sacrifice their, their liberty. Uh, and at some point in the near future, we may see that uh, stress tested uh, if China, for example, has a, a, a recession. So this, I think, is the, the end point. Um, and in the next 10 or 15 years, uh, we will, uh, perhaps in a chaotic, but also in an innovative and inventive way, make our collective journey towards that end point. And this period of sort of 10 or 15 years is something that I call the interregnum, which is an interesting old uh, English world, word uh, that denotes a, a sort of a period of flux between two rulers or two forms, uh, two, two governments. Um, and it's a period, I think, that will not be terribly clear uh, in terms of its uh, implications for world affairs, it would look very, very noisy. Uh, we may have, um, you know, many different, uh, many different events. And if I can characterize it as best I can, it's a period where the old order is beginning to uh, to break down, but then also at the same time the the new uh, world order is beginning to be constructed. So it's a mixture of uh, creation uh, and uh, destruction. Uh, and we can see that, for example, if I take um, a very, very important area of world institutions, my sense is that many of the, the institutions of the 20th century, the World Trade Organization, uh, maybe the World Health Organization, IMF and World Bank, they have either done what they were supposed to do uh, and or they are becoming uh, defunct in a new uh, and changing uh, world. Uh, many of them have crisis of leadership. Um, and, I, and I expect that in the next 
five or ten years, many of these will fade into the background. You may, you may see more uh, regional institutions. And then I think what's really crucial and what's a very, very important part of the discussion at the Goals Forum is to ask what are the new institutions of the 21st uh, century? Uh, do we, for example, need a new world climate institution of some sort um, that is populated by companies, by cities, by governments, and that has got real policy teeth in terms of helping to reduce uh, climate change in a very, very speedy way. Um, that, that, that's something I think that's quite crucial. We may also see uh, a need for a world uh, cyber war or cyber security agreement to police uh, cyber security. And again, that would have to be uh, made between governments. Um, uh, corporations will also be involved in, in, in crafting that. Uh, and there's many other things I think that um, can come to the fore. The World Health Organization could, for example, be uh, maybe supplanted by or aided by something like a World Men Mental Health Organization. So my point is that in the 21st century, we are going to have many new problems. Uh, most of them will be spurred and driven by technological advances and the need to, to marshal those so that they don't uh, impact humans in a uh, and society in a negative way. And, and I think the really exciting part of uh, maybe the next 10 or 20 years would be the fashioning of these institutions and crafting ways in which the big uh, poles can collaborate and also give voice to the many other populous countries in the world from Nigeria um, to Bangladesh to, uh, to Indonesia. Uh, I think there's a range of other things to, to bear in mind uh, as we go forward. Um, one, as an economist, that strikes me as being quite uh, pertinent uh, is the business cycle. Very, very dull topic, but uh, we've been spoilt over the last maybe uh, 20 or 30 years in that we've had three of the longest business cycles in the history of the, the world economy. We've had three business cycles, uh, expansion business cycles of uh, nearly nine years um, in, in, in each case. Uh, and that's simply extraordinary um, in the, the scheme of world history. Typically, business cycles have been much more uh, staccatoed, uh, much, much uh, shorter. Uh, and I think for a whole variety of reasons, the uh, reappearance of inflation, uh, rising interest rates, um, disruption uh, of many industries by, by technology, uh, the return of the inventory cycle, uh, and indebtedness, I think we're going back into uh, a world of shorter business cycles. That sounds very academic and very boring, but if you're running a company or a startup, uh, that is absolutely germane and fundamental to your, your, your planning uh, and how you structure your, your enterprise. Um, a third factor I want to emphasize, um, which again I think is important in the, in the context of the, the forum, um, is the idea of imbalances. One of the reasons that uh, globalization has come to an end is that it and all the other activity associated with it have created various uh, imbalances as they have uh, gone along. And I think the next 10 years will really be driven by the, the reduction of these imbalances. And I think for policymakers, they will spend most of their time uh, dealing with these imbalances until we get to sort of the, the end of this interregnum period. And what do I mean by this? Well, there's at least two, uh, maybe three imbalances that uh, are top of mind for me. Uh, one is indebtedness. Um, so the latter part of globalization, globalization was a bit like a, a an aging athlete, uh, maybe needed a bit of um, you know, sugar, a bit of drugs to, to, to keep uh, performing. Um, and at the corporate level, uh, at the level of many governments, um, we've seen debt levels, debt to GDP rise to record levels. Uh, in aggregate, world debt to GDP is as high now as uh, after the Second World War. And then the next peak is going back to the Napoleonic War. So that will put things um, in, in context. 
and that debt will have to be reduced. Uh, inflation is not a good way of doing it. Growth is the, the best way. Um, and I suspect that for the next maybe five or six years, given that interest rates are rising, you'll see a lot of governments and corporates uh, try and, and pare back that debt. One very extreme scenario is that uh, on the, the centenary of the 1924 uh, debt conference, the Dawes conference, we have another similar uh, conference. And I've, I've kind of sketched this out in my, my book, The Leveling, just to, to scare people that in 2024, we would need to have another world debt conference to uh, reapportion uh, these huge levels of debt and have some kind of debt forgiveness. Um, I think we'd need a pretty dramatic crisis uh, to get there. But uh, once that happened, I think that would kick off uh, another wave of massive financial innovation uh, and deepening of financial markets, particularly in China and, uh, and Asia. Um, and if you look at the chart of debt to GDP and how it's risen uh, over time, what is actually quite interesting is that the temperature of the uh, uh, of of the uh, uh, of the world of the climate uh, has risen in tandem with it. You will all know that um, of the ten hottest years on record, uh, nine of those have been in the last whatever ten or eleven years. Uh, we'll all know that the uh, almost on a monthly basis now, somewhere around the world, new records for climate extremes are being set, and we are seeing more physical evidence of uh, climate damage. Uh, and it's no surprise that this comes at the end of uh, a period of huge uh, economic growth, uh, of a rise in prosperity, a rise in, in urbanization. Um, and, and, I, and again, this is the big challenge uh, of our time. Um, and I don't think it's a challenge of, uh, of science. I think the scientific evidence is unambiguous. Uh, I don't think it's a challenge of innovation. Uh, around Europe, I see many innovative companies um, doing things like uh, carbon extraction. Um, and I think one of the most exciting areas in innovation technology uh, is in the, the green economy. But rather, I think it's a, it's a, a challenge of uh, game theory or a challenge of collaboration and a, and a challenge of, of getting the big cities, the big governments, the big polluters uh, to come together and agree uh, a really credible way to pare back climate damage. Um, and we, we haven't seen that. And my pessimistic self uh, says that we would need a crisis or, or several mini crises around the world, uh, be it in the form of, of drought, forced migration, um, uh, wildfires uh, to convince people to, to, to do that. And that would be a great pity if we have to, to get to that point. Uh, so those are some of the, the challenges ahead. Uh, and just to, to wrap up, I, I think if you examine the, the flow of ideas, the flow of trade, the flow of finance, uh, the flow of people as well, uh, we will find pretty inconclusive, ev pretty conclusive evidence rather that globalization has come to an end, that this period of interconnectedness and interdependence uh, has now unraveled or is beginning to unravel. Uh, and accepting that is an important uh, point because that helps us to look forward. And looking forward the next 10 or 15 years will be this interregnum, this interim period where these imbalances uh, need to be resolved. Um, where I think we have to direct our attention away from some of the crumbling old institutions and focus our energy on building the new ones uh, and then arrive uh, at this destination, which I call a multipolar world, uh, in 10 or 15 years. So I'll perhaps uh, uh, stop there, Elmer. Uh, and, and again, thank you and colleagues for inviting me to, to speak.